Th thank you, Ben, and thank you, everyone. Um, let's, I'd like to kick this off in prayer. I might, I might need it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for uh, your kindness to us. Thank you, Lord, that you dwell with us, that you've turned your hearts toward us. I pray that you'd use this talk to enlarge the hearts of us as fathers and thus enlarge the souls of our kids. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So greetings to you. Um, as Ben said, I'm a Cubs fan. And I also know that I stand between you all and soft serve ice cream, so I'm aware of that. Um, I'm kind of new to this stage. Many of you know me, but you don't necessarily know me in this setting. So I wanted to greet you all from my perspective and introduce myself a little bit. Um, I am, as Ben mentioned, the parent of seven kids. I'm a church officer and a businessman. I am not a pastor. I'm not an author. I'm not a PhD, um, which fortunately for me doesn't matter, I guess, in terms of speaking up here. Um, my kids range from 14 to three. Um, when we had our first four, our oldest was 36 months, 37. She just turned three when our twins were born. And we call that the sweaty eyeball phase. My wife coined that, I think it's rather apt. Um, if you see my eyeballs sweat up here, don't worry, I'll be okay. I am fortunately the husband of a wonderful woman, Rachel. Um, you may have seen her on the internet. Um, I'm the son of two wonderful parents, the brother of five siblings, one who's here in the room, and a host of in-laws. But most of all, like most of you all, or all of you, I'm a child of God, redeemed by the blood of the lamb, and my only ability to speak to you about parenting today comes from our Heavenly Father's abundant love for me. I wish my lectern was taller, because then as I read, I could look up so forgive me if I seem a bit hunched. Now you have a hunch about why. I was raised in the western suburbs of Chicago, the Wheaton area. Um, I didn't go to Wheaton College. No comment. Um, I was homeschooled when that was a much newer movement than it is today. I was homeschooled first through eighth grade. My parents took a wonderful stand then to keep us as kids by not turning us over to the government schools, something I'm forever grateful for. I attended New St. Andrews College, as was mentioned. I graduated in 2006, and now have the privilege of serving on the Board of Trustees. I will say that I came as a 21-year-old freshman. I got an a, a associate's degree in general studies from a community college. I'm just really listing my academic bona fides here. <laughs> uh, who's the community college's mascot, by the way, is, is a roadrunner, so. That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I came to NSA as a 21-year-old, coming for a single year. Gonna, I was going to try it out, because I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And later, I get to be on a panel with Nate and Ben. And I actually, my first teachers at NSA were Nate and Ben. And the first oral final at NSA, when I started, we had oral finals. So that meant that you had to like go to one final with all of your teachers. And the teachers would sit there and each would ask you their questions. And it sounds, it felt like it sounds, it's even better when you just had just started pursuing the sister and sister-in-law in your first final. Um, anyway, now you know more about me. That was a fun time. So I am very blessed to be with you here today speaking. And frankly, I'm far more blessed to just be here in Moscow, Idaho, in the family I've, I'm in, with the people I've been brought by God to fellowship with and the things I've been learning. As a caveat, um, since in my work I do get to present a lot, I will say that if any time during the presentation you have this sort of tingling desire to buy software, <laughs> don't worry. That's just my normal shtick coming through. <laughs> Sorry, Logos guy, I'm better than you. Uh, so now you know more about me and my perspective. Let's consider fat souls beginning where I'd like to end. So here's where I'm headed. Fathers, and I will say, mothers, this is primarily a, a conversation with fathers. That's, just know that. Um, fathers, you are the glory of your children. 
The fatness of your kids' souls relates to the size of your heart. And lastly, I'm going to exhort you to be the blessing man. I'm going to work from glory to glory, ending on how fathers are the glory of their children. But before that, let's start with Shekinah glory. Shekinah glory is the manifestation of God's presence on earth. Our God is a God who tabernacles with us. He dwells with us. He leads us and he carries us. Come with me to the beginning of Deuteronomy, where the people of Israel are about to enter the promised land. They're on the cusp of doing so, and God has commanded them to go and possess it. Deuteronomy 1.8. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. But they don't do it. They're afraid. They rebel against God, and they do not go up and possess the land when he commands them to. Moses exhorts them to remember that God has dwelt with them. Moses reminds them of his manifest glory, God's manifest glory, in Deuteronomy 1, 29 through 33. Then I said to you, this is Moses, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. God was the manifest glory of Israel in the wilderness, the pillar of fire by night lit their path and protected them, and the cloud by day provided shade. How can you possibly rebel, or how is it possible to rebel a God who is so visibly present? The fire by night and the cloud by day, I probably reversed that when I just read it. I'll do that throughout, forgive me. How can you not follow him to the blessing he's promised? How is that possible? Well, here's my take, but I'd like to move one step further back in the passage in Deuteronomy to Deuteronomy 1.26. Nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakim there, sons of the Anakim. This is an interesting point about giants, the cowering Israelites. What about, um, they had sent, Moses had sent 12 spies into the land and they came back with this report. If you remember, this is the report they came back with. They also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. And they brought back word to us saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God is giving us. The spies go up in the land and come back, report it as good. And the people of Israel cower because of giants. These Israelites who've witnessed with their own eyes the delivering power of the Almighty God use something they haven't seen as a reason to disobey. There appear to be no eyewitness accounts of the giants here, but even so, it wouldn't matter if there were any. They've seen his Shekinah glory in the wilderness leading them, and they've seen him fight for them. This is Exodus 14, 24 and following. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. The people of Israel have the manifest protection of the almighty God leading them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And what happens? Well, they have heart troubles. Their brethren discourage them. Another way I'd read this is that they discourage each other. The literal meaning in Hebrew 
is our brethren have melted our hearts. But the English discouraged is still appropriate because it can be understood as to remove the heart. Courage comes to us in English through French from Latin, core, which is the heart. To discourage something is to remove its heart. But I actually think I prefer the impact of melted in the Hebrew. It's like the snow that so many of us dealt with this past winter, or this past, what, February, really, that's now gone. The melted heart hasn't just changed states while remaining in the same place, like melt, melting ice in a cup. Instead, it wastes away. It seeps away. It's gone. Their hearts are gone. They have melted. The Hebrew word here for heart is lev. I'm going to spend some time on this one. It can be interpreted not only as heart, but also as mind or understanding. And as such, it connotates the three key inner traits of man. His mind, sorry, emotion, thought or understanding, and will. So today when we say heart, we typically refer to emotions or feelings. But in Hebrew, the conception of heart is significantly richer. For example, in this instance, their melted hearts, I would say, stem from a failure of understanding, a failure of memory, a failure of judgment, and a failure of will. This is not simply a failure of feeling. It's not that they just didn't feel like going up into the land. It's that their faculty for doing what they need to do had, had melted, had shrunk. Their fear comes from a narrowing of their faculties. A contrasting example of Lev, excuse me, is helpful here. These, these, these lights really dry the mouth. For you guys, if you ever are up here, just know that. Sorry. Um, a contrasting example of Lev is helpful here to see the richness of meaning. Hearts can melt, but they can also be hardened. Consider Pharaoh's heart in Exodus 8.15. When, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. For Pharaoh, you get the sense that each plague forces him to be humble, to submit to God's command, and then once the relief comes, so comes his obstinance as a king who will not yield to God's authority. A melted heart results from a failure to believe in God's faithfulness, and a hardened heart is the failure to honor God's authority. This is the contrast of fear and arrogance, the fear that comes when one doesn't trust the living God, and the arrogance that comes from refusing to live in the fear of God. To contrast both of these, melted and hardened, we have Solomon. 1 Kings 3, verse 6 and following. And Solomon said, he's come to God at this point, you have shown great mercy to your servant David my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You've continued this great kindness for him, and you've given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Solomon recognizes the ruling task before him and seeks for wisdom. He recognized his profound lack of capacity to rule. He's also honoring his father David here. He heeds his father's charge. This is that charge, if you recall, from 1 Kings 2, 3 and following. David speaking to Solomon. And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne in Israel. 
Solomon honors his father, David, and he asks for wisdom in ruling. And God grants him more wisdom and understanding than any other man. He grants him a heart expansion. 1 Kings 4.29 And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart, like the sand on the seashore. But let's be clear, Solomon's heart enlargement isn't about his ability to emote. God didn't make him super empathetic. God didn't give him really high emotional intelligence. This is a clear reference to his increased capabilities for ruling and for judging, for having the imagination, ambition, and vision to faithfully rule a people. In contrast, when we say today that someone has a big heart, we don't really say anything about their ability to lead and rule. We mean they're nice. Oh, he's just got such a big heart. You know, he's just so nice. So let me jump up and down on this. Heart throughout this talk is about our faculties. The heart is the organ in Hebrew of the intellect, of judgment, of emotion, of memory, of will, of imagination. <clears throat> From now on, when I talk about heart, think bigger than you normally would. When I talk about enlarged hearts and hearts turned from fathers to children, think about more than you normally would. So how do we get an enlarged heart? Well, the psalmist shows us in Psalm 119.32. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Loving God's law and keeping his commandments, running their course and pursuing them, leads to this expansion. Notice with me that we have proof that God delivers on his promise to enlarge hearts. What did David charge Solomon with? He charged him to walk in God's course, to keep his commandments and testimonies. And Solomon does. And he goes to God and says, give me the wisdom of your commandments. I need them. I can't do this without them. And God enlarges his heart. Going back to the people of Israel briefly, I want to make two more observations about their melted hearts before we move on to see how God solves this heart problem and how I see it relating to parenting. The first is, is the issue that the Israelites are the object of the discouragement. If you remember, our brethren have discouraged our hearts. Isn't this just how we people do things? This reminds me of my favorite quote from Seinfeld. People, they're the worst. <laughs> or more sympathetically, people, we're the worst. The statement is not in this verse that my heart's discouraged implying that I or the subject have discouraged it. Instead, the discouragement is from the brethren. Effectively, they're saying, our lack of courage and faith is someone else's fault. This is the epitome of a melted heart, a wasted away heart that can't even see its own responsibility. And again, when I say heart, I mean that broader set of faculties. The second observation is that heart melt, heart failure spreads. It's contagious. Consider Deuteronomy 28, one of the principles given to Israel for preparing for and going to war. The officers shall speak further to the people and say, what man is there who is fearful and faint hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest his brethren faint, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. And so it shall be when the officers have finished speaking to the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. If in your midst there are those whose hearts are melted in this setting that faint, the command is to send them home. You do not want them in battle. That kind of limited faculty and the fear that comes from it spreads. I'll come back to this observation later for some application. But again, if you remember anything about hearts that melt, Remember, it's a contagious condition. With that said, we still have heart failure to deal with. And I have to do some work to demonstrate how hearts and glory connect to fat souls and kept kids. So do me a favor, put Shekinah glory and the heart melt of Israel in your mental parking lot over here. We'll come back to them. 
Let's talk about fat souls. Having a richer view of the heart and some of the contrasting directions it can go in Hebrew, melting, enlarging, and hardening. Let's consider what a soul is. In the same way that we just can't bring our modern conception of heart to the Hebrew, we cannot bring our conception of soul either. The great Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5 is one of many places in scripture where the heart and soul are closely paired. We do well to pay attention to the richer meaning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. The Hebrew word here that is translated soul is nefesh. This is the primary word for soul in Hebrew. Soul is not the same thing as spirit, meaning it doesn't simply connotate an immaterial element of our beings. Instead, nefesh has a richer meaning. It can be life, soul, creature, person, appetite, and mind. The original meaning of the word was in the neighborhood of to breathe. We find that reference, allusion to that in Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being, a living nefesh. Our soul is our very life, our entire living being. It is not simply a spiritual, immaterial element of us. Consider Psalm 66, verses eight through nine. O bless our God, O you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul, our nefesh, among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. God keeps our lives. We also see that souls can be dried up. The rabble, oh, sorry, let me get my reference. Numbers 11, four through six. The rabble among them had a strong craving and the Israelites also wept again and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength, our nefesh is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. God responds to these complaints from his people about manna by granting their request and sending meat in the form of quail. Complaining leads to leanness of soul. I have proof, but first I'm gonna get a drink. Psalm 106, they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. In this instance, their physical desire for meat is met, but they're so fixated on their lust that the physical filling leads to the leanness of their nefesh. This is an interesting comparison to their own complaint against God. They're saying in one setting that their nefesh, their strength is weakened by having to eat manna, and God, in turn, gives them quail, and by doing so, he sends actual leanness into their nefesh. So our souls represent our entire person, our living being, and our souls, our nefesh, I would argue, include our hearts. These are overlapping concepts. The nefesh represents more of our physical self than our modern interpretation of soul allows for, and lev, or heart, represents far more of our immaterial self than I believe our current conception of heart allows for. So then, how do we make fat souls? How do we make fat nefesh? Well, we make full hearts, enlarged hearts, but the glory is we can't do any of it on our own. At this point, let's return to Shekinah glory and the melted hearts of the people of Israel pull those concepts out of the parking lot I had you put them in. So how does God fix this problem of a people who will not possess the land? As we know, the promise of the Old Testament is the yearning for the glory of the coming of Christ, when hearts of stone will be replaced with hearts of flesh, and when the word of God is written on the tablets of our hearts. The solution is new hearts and the very glory of God dwelling in them. This is from Romans 8, 9 and following. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, 
the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, the spirit, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. When the Spirit of God is poured out at Pentecost, we see pillars of fire, tongues of flame. Pentecost is a greater revelation of the Shekinah glory, a further manifestation of God's presence. Not only because of that symbolism, but because of now in the new covenant, the very Spirit of God dwells within us. In the wilderness, the Shekinah glory dwelt, God dwelt with his people. He was present. There was a, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. The shift here is the movement of that glory from being around the people of God to being in the very hearts of the people of God. Jesus Christ is the great Emmanuel, God with us, and we dwell with him through the Spirit, and as we are in him and he in the Father, so we dwell with the Father. This is truly an astounding thing. God has sent his spirit into our hearts, into the hearts of his children, so that they can turn and say, Abba, Father. We are sons. We have new hearts, hearts of flesh. He has turned his heart toward us and dwelt in his heart, in our hearts, through his spirit. Let's consider this glorious reality in terms of Malachi 4, 4 through 6. This is a passage that has always sort of stuck with me in in that I couldn't figure out what it meant. And I don't know that I've figured it out yet, but hopefully I've made some progress here and you'll see that in the conversation or in the, the, what I follow up with. So this is Malachi 4. These are the last two verses of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So we're given the promise of the coming Messiah and the day of the Lord. And in that day, fathers' hearts will be turned towards their children and children's hearts to their fathers. What is it about the gospel that does that? What is it about the gospel that does that? Remember these hearts, though, that we've been talking about. These, this is an Old Testament passage. This is the Hebrew. So these are hearts that are the whole faculties of a person, not simply their affections. The intellect, God at the coming of the Messiah, happening at the same time, the hearts of fathers will turn to children, not just their feelings, their judgment, their will, their understanding, all of their faculties will be turned towards their children and the children's toward the fathers. So how does this, how does this work? What does it mean? Well, when God turns our hearts to him and we cry, Abba, Father, we can, we can then turn our hearts to our children. I think this is faithful parenting. This is fat soul making. This is fruit and not works. Praise the Lord. I say then, this is Galatians 5, verses 16 and, and following. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the, lusts against, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not know the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you go back to the passage in Deuteronomy. The Shekinah glory leads the people through the wilderness. God carries the people through the wilderness as a father carries his son. Here in the New Testament, we are led by the Spirit. Further down in verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against us there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. 
The flesh works, the spirit bears fruit. If we work on our own efforts to parent our kids, we'll get hatred, contention, dissensions, and outbursts of wrath. Those are the works of the flesh. In order to parent faithfully, we need to walk in the spirit that we already live in. And I'd argue that when our hearts are turned to our Heavenly Father, we can in turn imitate him for our kids. We can turn our hearts toward them and in the way that he does toward us, which is, again, more than just our affections. We can set rules that free them. We can rejoice in sacrificing for them. And we can teach them that their identity is most complete when they live faithfully under the authority of their Heavenly Father. We obey God by disciplining them and teaching them that freedom, that in freedom comes, obe- sorry, that freedom comes in obedience. We all walk in the Spirit. So at the beginning of the talk, I outlined the end in mind. And these were the three propositions that I'd like to expand. Fathers, you're the glory of your children. The fatness of your kids' souls relates to the size of your heart. And lastly, that you should be the blessing man. So fathers, you're the glory of your children. We started with glory, God's Shekinah glory, how he carried his children through the wilderness like a father. I'm going to read this passage from Deuteronomy 1, verse 30 again. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that that you went until you came to this place. God was carrying, protecting, providing for, and leading his people to the possession of the land he promised. The cloud by day and the fire by night were the manifestation of that. We also saw how God resolved this sort of big picture heart problem of his people. He turned his heart to us. He sent his son to dwell among us. He gave us new hearts and through Christ now his spirit dwells in us. Because of that, we can turn to him and cry, Abba, Father. We are now led by the Shekinah glory, not around us, but within us. Praise the Lord. Because of this, I would say there is no Christian who is fatherless. How do we reflect this glory for our children? Proverbs 17, 6 says, children's children are the crown of old men and the glory of children is their father. Typically, that verse is interpreted as kids really like their dads. They think they're great and strong, which I'm not saying that's not entirely false, but I'm gonna give a different perspective on this. The glory of children is their father. Fathers are like the Shekinah glory for their children. They should be. They should lead, protect, dwell with, and take, lead, protect, dwell with, and help go up into the possession of the land. Practically, what this means, I think, is that we should dwell with our children. We should be present with our whole selves, our nefesh, in their day-to-day lives. It should not be said of us that our lips were near our children, but our hearts were far from them. I know just a really practical example. When I get home from work some days, I feel kind of cooked and booked. I'm cooked from my day mentally, and my thoughts are booked for the night about work and other things. In simple ways, as when I say be present with yourself, I mean things as simply as when you're home with your kids, direct your will, your attention, your judgment, your desire, your understanding, your faculties toward your kids. Draw your heart near to them, not just your your body. So we should turn our hearts to them, and by that, again, I don't mean just our affections. We should protect them. We should fight for them. We should show them how to honor our Heavenly Father. And we should do this by going up before them and including them in the possessing of the land. This is a post-millennial conference. The last point is the one I want to lean into. I'm convinced that the fatness of your children's souls is related to how engaged you are as a father in working out the kingdom of God in the place he's called you to do so without the fear of giants in the land. To put it differently, the fatness of your kids' souls relates to the size of your heart. Solomon needed his heart enlarged in order to know 
how to rule. As fathers in the callings we've been given, we need our hearts enlarged in order to know how to rule. And not only how to rule, but how to expand the kingdom of God in the place he's called us to. So how do we do that? Well, we run the course of his testimonies and desire to obtain his promises. Remember remember the psalm. If you do this and you do it with ambition and you do it with imagination that actively hopes in God and you include your kids, then their souls will fatten. So what's my proof of this? Well, it's the Wilson family. What most people don't understand, and what I'm grateful for the perspective on, is that an underlying root to the success of the Mos- is, is an underlying root to the success of the Moscow project. Doug and his father before him have always been ambitious for the kingdom and its outworking. There's all, they've also been ambitious for their kids. And at each stage, they've brought their kids into the kingdom work. Also, something I'm super grateful for. Our leadership led by Doug here does not back down from giants in the land. You can't have an enlarged heart if your heart is melted. What happened to the Israelites, what kept them from going up into the, possess the land when they had seen the glory of God manifest for them, fighting for them? Well, they were afraid. This is a time, I think, in our history, culturally, that there are lots of opportunities for Christian fathers' hearts to melt. We are in a world that is now awoken, right? There's lots of pressure on Christians. Evil is called good and good is called evil. And if you are a Christian, you're an intolerant terrorist. In that environment, we need fathers to have enlarged hearts, not hearts that melt. And I will, if you you want a shorthand from my point of view, insight, secret sauce into the success of what's happened as I've seen it in the Wilson clan, it's that Doug and Nancy have been at the plow. They haven't let go. They're working to build the kingdom. They're working to possess the land and including their kids in it. And they're not afraid of the giants. Conflict is not a problem. Conflict is a sound when, when your plow hits rocks in the dirt. How's that, Doug? <laughs> you want your plow to spark, people. I think your kids' hearts will follow suit with yours. So keep your kids and pursue God and glory and his kingdom and ask God to enlarge your heart, your vision, your intellect, and your whole self for your kids. Ask God to give you an ambition and an imagination for the life of your kids and the kingdom of God and their role in it that maybe you don't have right now. Lastly, I suggest that you do this by being the blessing man. What do I mean? Well, Proverbs 11:25 says, the liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. The word liberal is translated from beraka, or blessing. It's Hebrew for blessing. It's used in a couple of related places. Uh, first, God promises to make Abram a beraka, a blessing. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram is a blessing man. He's a man who is a blessing. The liberal soul, the Barakah Nefesh, a loose transliteration, is the blessing soul. But notice the second half, that that soul will be made fat, the second clause of that verse, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. I think this is, this is how. He who is poured out will be poured into. This is different, wonderfully different than the melt we see that I've been talking about, a heart that melts. This is a heart that's poured into, a heart that's poured out, and a heart that's poured into. So what kind of promise does God give to us 
when we look to pour our hearts out into our kids. This is from Malachi 3.10. This is the same word. This word in Hebrew is only used in a few places in this tense, so I think these relate. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. God will pour out a blessing that there will not be room enough for us to receive. That blessing, that pouring of blessing is something God loves to do. And I would argue that as fathers, tithe to your children what you have. Pour out your heart and wait for God to surprise you. He will pour back into you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Last verse, last verse, blessing man. And this literally means the liberal soul, the liberal nefesh is the blessing man. He is a blessing, he is blessed, and those around him are blessed by him. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, it will be put into your bosom. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Luke 6, 38. As we work to make our kids' hearts, their souls fat, know that what we pour out in faith, God will double down on. And that is a great kindness and a great mercy. Again, this is not a work, but a fruit. Thank you for your time and attention. I'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you bless us and that you make our hearts enlarged, that you sent your son to dwell with us and your spirit to dwell within us. Lord, may we be that glory for our children and may when we turn our hearts to you, that same obedient turning be a turning to our children. And may the blessing that pours out, not only pour out to them, but to a thousand generations in the way that you promised to Abram. Do now so, Lord, for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you.